Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the RBG Holdings PLC investor presentation for results for the 12 months ended 31st of December 2020. Throughout this presentation, investors are being listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted anytime via the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and you'll be notified once they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Nicola Fulston, CEO and Robert Parker, CFO. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. And apologies, everyone. We're a few minutes late. It's a very tight schedule um, today on our results day. Um, Welcome to this, our results presentation for our 2020 results. I'm joined today by Robert. And for those of you that don't know anything about us, I'll just do a quick intro, although I've done it many times. Um, my background is that I bought, um, I ran, bought and acquired and sold Brands Hatch Leisure Group of Circuits back in the 90s and the early 2000s, um, returning to investors six, seven times money in the intervening years. I ran a private equity um, business making investments in um, small um, private companies around the world. Um, and I'm joined today by Robert, who um, I'm sure later will talk about um, his experience both in the public and private markets. Moving on to where RBG Holdings is today, um, I would, by way of reminder, um, uh, point out that we acquired Rosenblatt Limited in 2018, we acquired Convex Capital in 2019. And we launched Lionfish Litigation Finance in May 2020 um, as a startup business. Um, today, we are announcing in our results that business is profitable. That is no mean achievement for a startup business. Adnitor is a small IT consultancy services business um, that we acquired in the early part of 2020. Um, part acquired, I should say, owning only 40% of it as of today. Um, with the aim of ensuring that all of our IT and tech systems become self-funding um, over time. And today we're announcing the intention to acquire the trading and assets of Memory Crystal, um, a well-known um, city law firm that is currently a competitor of Rosenblatt's um, and, and the acquisition is subject only to SRA approval. Moving on to our stated strategy, um, we always in these presentations remind everyone of what we said at the time of our flotation, which was to focus on maintaining high margins in all of the work that we do and all of the acquisitions that we take on. Um, if we were to look um, at the memory crystal business today, which we will do later on, um, that is also um, got the potential to be a higher margin business than the industry average. Um, we stated that our um, uh, Ambition was to do selective M&A um, and to focus only on um, specialist businesses that had a natural fit with the businesses already in our group, but we would only do so um, at the right value and with the right deal structure. Uh, we said that we would move into um, litigation finance, um, which we have done both through um, the um, finance that we undertake through the legal business um, and through um, Lionfish Litigation Finance, which I will come on to later. How are we progressing against that strategy? Um, the legal business has grown and diversified um, in the time, um, achieving um, the highest ever legal service revenue in 2020, and in a pandemic, no less of 20.9 million, up 15% uh, on the prior year. The prior year's numbers that are in the market do have some um, realized gains on investments, um, which we do not have in this period. Uh, we've also had the best ever year for um, EBITDA and achieved margins well in excess of 35%. Um, the other important um, uh, change for Rosenblatt was the appointment of Barry Roach as a dedicated managing director for that business. We are, after all, a people business, and it is really important to have a dedicated management, and that became ever more important through the pandemic. Um, to give time um, to uh, listen to people's concerns. We successfully moved into litigation finance um, and we appointed um, Tets to run Lionfish, investing in seven investments um, during the period, announcing today our first realization um, of one of those investments as a proof of concept. Announced anyone told Nikki? Um, Robert, you're not on mute. Um, 
um, realizing today one um, investment which is only in the hundreds of thousands and will be part of our um, current numbers and is not an elephantine return, but has been done in a, in a very short period of time. We have begun the diversification diversification of our revenue beyond legal services when we acquired uh, Convex Capital. It's important to note uh, when we talk about Convex and their bounce back um, this year to remember that in um, 2020 they lost 900,000 pounds, which makes our results today, in my opinion, um, ever more impressive. Um, the M&A activity has bounced back in 2021. They have completed seven deals so far with a year-to-date revenue of 4.5 million, having only completed two deals in the whole of 2020. The acquisition of Memory Crystal um, enables us to consolidate um, our um, legal services division and more importantly, to diversify and reduce our reliance on any one income driver. Memory Crystal is a um, equity partnership with some 29 partners. Um, it is bigger than us and it enables us to move into other areas. They are particularly focused on transactions, 55% of their revenues coming from transactions, which is a natural fit with RBL, as we will show later in this presentation. Looking now specifically at the acquisition of Memory Crystal, Memory Crystal is um, a large transaction firm with 146 staff, 29 partners and 66 BN is making it larger than Rosenblatt Limited. Um, it does have a strong dispute resolution and real estate also have a strong contentious um, department. Um, and in the year ending 30th April 2020, you can see they had revenues of 23.2 million. Their forecast out turn for 30th of April 2020 is 25 million revenues. This will also be their best year ever. The rationale um, for why we wanted to do this deal. We have been targeting Memory Crystal for over two years, although our um, negotiations with it only started um, in the middle of last year. Um, Memory Crystal was for us a very natural fit. We have known them for a long time. Our senior partners know each other. We have lost staff to them. We have uh, competed for business with them. Um, and they have always been somebody who has been on our, our horizon. Um, we think that the price we have paid is an, a, an appropriate price, that we have value for money, and that there is a strong um, cultural fit because we both share a similar client bases being entrepreneurial, high net worth, founder, owner driven businesses. Um, and therefore, this provides us with a real opportunity um, to uh, integrate those businesses with the same cultural fit. Robert's just going to take us through the consideration so that I don't mess it up. Total consideration for the deal was 30 million, and that comprises of 18.8 million in cash and 11.2 million in shares. Um, slightly weighted towards cash on the basis that we take from them net assets of 7.1 million, which are predominantly cash or cash related. On completion, we will pay 12 million in cash and 11.2 million in shares. The remaining cash will be paid in two tranches over the next 12 months. In order to support the wider group and the transaction, we've extended our RCF, which was 10 million to 15 million. And in addition to that, we've taken on an acquisition loan of 10 million to fund the acquisition. Um, and Nikki will talk a little bit about the key lock in to employees and partners um, and the non competes. So some of you will notice that we have paid 60% in cash for this transaction and 40% in shares, which is a reverse of our normally stated position. There are two reasons that drove that decision. The first is that at the time that we struck um, the deal, our share price, in our opinion, did not reflect a true value for our business, and we did not feel comfortable to transact uh, materially at that level. In addition, you will see that there is a considerable balance sheet here, and we believe that if we apply the metrics um, that we do in RBL, we'll be able to drive cash out of that to reduce um, the net consideration. Um, the strike price for the equity was struck at £1.15 last night on a volume weighted past five um, days. We talk a lot um, and we will no doubt be talking more in the coming days about the integration of this acquisition. 
We do see these businesses as standing side by side. We want to protect um, the, the door. The doors. Um, sorry, I'm being beset by a hornet in my office, so we're just going to open up and try and get rid of it. Um, we, we do see these businesses operating independently of each other, not competing against each other, um, and therefore um, um, and utilizing the loyalty that exists for both brands. There will be an opportunity to integrate. Obviously, there are natural targets in terms of the back office, but more importantly, the supplier contracts and IT. Um, but it's important to note that this is a very big business and we are also expanding. So there will not be the obvious restructuring or, or, or uh, of staff or teams that you might expect on such an acquisition. Moving on to uh, the comparison of Memory Crystal with um, RBL, you can see on this slide um, the original um, pie chart we've shown you for Rosenblatt last year. Unusually, its corporate revenue was as high as 25%, which is down to a one off transaction where we acted for Simon Cowell and his buyout of Psycho from Sony. Um, normally, our contentious revenues will sit between 60 and 80% um, in that business. On the left hand side, you will see a new pie chart from Crystal, which shows their corporate um, uh, commercial IPT and real estate um, uh, revenues are about 59% of their revenues um, of their business. So as you can see, there is a natural fit um, there. However, as a result of the fact that their revenue is skewed to transactional, um, their margins will naturally be lower than a business that is predominantly contentious. Um, and this is reflected to a certain degree on the boxes on the right hand side. The revenue per fee owner is materially lower than Rosenblatt. We would expect it to be lower than Rosenblatt for a non-contentious dominated business, but we do think there is scope to improve those numbers. They do work on a similar utilization and realization metrics, but they have a lower number of target hours, which is commensurate with what we have said about um, legal businesses in, the, in this sector. And we would be looking to improve those over the, over the coming time. In the longer term, there, there will be a look at whether we can um, position um, the businesses in behind two different brands. So in effect, Rosenblatt may well in the future be positioned as a solely contentious brand and Memory Crystal as our non-contentious brand. But that is aspirational on my part rather than being something that has been set in stone. Um, this will be, whilst we will no doubt report some metrics around the individual businesses, we do intend to consolidate our financial results and in the future, you will see financials for our services division presented together as we have no intention Mr. Rosenblatt to compete. And I'll now hand over to Robert to take you through the financials. Yeah, morning, everyone, afternoon. Um, I just wanted to be sure that we got full recognition for what we did in the past last year, actually. We've got a very strong set of results and um, in a way, we don't want the acquisition to drown out the performance of the existing business, which was very good. Um, so as I say, our, our group revenue and gains have been up 88% to 25.6 million. You take that in context of the year that we've just gone through with the pandemic, and we're still living through part of that now. So there was a significant delivery from the business. Our professional services revenue, and that includes RBL and Convex, was up. 12.6% to 22.4 million. The large driver in that is RBL, and I'll pull that out in a couple of slides to show you where we've driven with that. Gains on litigation assets are 3.1 million as opposed to 3.8 million. This is everyday business for us as now. As Nikki's shown that the group is diversified, we've got professional services revenues. We also deliver litigation revenues or income or gains on the business. We delivered an EBITDA of 10.2 million, um, but an adjusted EBITDA of 7.5 million. Included in the 10.2 is the 2.6 million right back of the deferred convex earnout, which they didn't earn because of the pandemic fundamentally. Profit before tax of 7.7 million, again, including the 2.6 million right back. Um, net cash of 3.5 million, so positive cash into the business, strong driver and strong cash collection as opposed to 1.9 million in 2019 and a negative 1.6 million or net debt at the half year last year. 
paid a dividend of 3p per share for 2020 and to date we've got we are carrying 6.3 million of asset litigation assets in our balance sheet up from 2.2 million and I'll talk a little bit more of how we're accounting for that in the past we are always a commercial business uh, in RBL we drive our debtor days and our lockup with the support of our fee earners so the lockup in RBL are 99 days I think this is significantly in front of the average for the industry and significantly in front of our 2019 numbers so all through the difficult period, we've been driving on cash collection and the realization of our WIP in order to drive the business forward. I'll just move over to the next slide. So I want to pull out a few bits on the income statement. Um, I mentioned the revenue and professional services were up 12.6%. Um, the increase, which is effectively 2.8 million, effectively RBO contributed 2.8 million. Convex went back last year by 0.3 of a million. So a very strong year for RBL, um, one of our strongest, or if not the strongest ever. So RBL revenues were up 15% to 20.9. And a large contributor in that, or a significant contributor compared to last year, was the um, corporate section within our business. DR is always a strong performer. Last year, corporate delivered circa 5 million in revenue in comparison to 2 million in the year before. Our utilization and realization are, I believe, the best in our peer group, the listed peer group, and the strongest within the sector as well. So 89% utilization, 106% realization on a target of 1,500 hours. That all the way drives through to our average revenue per fee earner of £426,000. Again, significantly up on where we were last year. So a really strong performance from RBL. We talk about our gains on litigation assets of 3.1 million. Um, I want to break this down. Obviously, we have to account for this under IFRS 9, where we fair value this. As a business, we strongly try to drive to keep this as close to cash as possible, although it's a fair value method. So last year, we, we sold and had cash received for 3.5 million for the disposals. These disposals are non-recourse, um, and we're selling a percentage share of the potential upside. As part of IFRS, what we release from, from that is the is the cost of sale projected to the end of end of the investment. And then there's a fair value uplift. So what you will see in our PL, we're recognizing 3.1 million of the gain. The actual cash proceeds were 3.5 million. So we're below the actual cash amount that we received in the business. So I believe a very conservative way of accounting for this under the regulations that are in place. Our personnel costs have increased. We're now 14.8 million, and that's mainly due to the average number of employees. Last year, we only had three months of convex. This year, we've got the full 12 months. So our average number of employees are up to 90 from 81. Other expenses, as you see there, are, are quite low in comparison to last year, to, uh, 0.6 million. That's including the right back of the 2.6 million of convex deferred earnout. Adjusted EBITDA of 7.6 million is circa 29% of our, our revenues, slightly below our target. We want to be mid or higher of 30%. And, and mainly the impact on that was Convex. So Convex had a negative EBITDA last year of 0.9 million. If you compare that to the positive last year of 1.2, so there was effectively a 2 million knock on from, from the non performance of Convex. But as we said, that COVID was a quite a significant impact on the business. And this year, year to date, they've delivered seven deals and revenue of 4.5 million. So a significant bounce back by that business and a strong pipeline, as Nikki will highlight as we go forward. In the balance sheet, I just want to pull out a few items. Um, trade debtors, as I say, our debtors and our, our whip are managed quite strongly. So we've got 7.7 .7 million locked up in there. There was 11 million in the previous year, but that was down to a timing difference at the year end when we were billing these litigation assets and our trade debtors as well. Um, so that has flowed through the business. Again, a strong lockup position, the 99 days, and our trade debtors are 47. So a lot of hard work has gone in from the finance team, supported by our fee owners as part of that. The trade and other payables are 3.8 million down from 6.7 last year, and that is fundamentally the write-off of the 
or the reduction is the write off of the deferred earn out. We've got net cash of 3.5 million. In March of last year, we did draw down our RCF, the 10 million RCF. We were slightly uncertain on how the banks would behave, um, whether they would behave in the, pre in the way they pre previously behaved. Um, so we sit with 13.5 million of cash in the bank at the year end. Obviously, that was offset by the 10 million RCF. Our intangible um, net assets of 35 million. We haven't changed this. We believe both RBL and Convex are fair valued at the values that we're holding in our accounts. And the net litigation assets, as we've highlighted on a previous slide, were 6.3 million. And again, I want to highlight that you know, this year we've invested 4.5 million of our own cash in these assets. 1.8 million of that was committed to Lionfish. And then there's been a, a fair value of adjustment as we write off the cost of sale and then we revalue the carrying value of that asset. But as you will see, the carrying value of the asset in our balance sheet is below the cash investments that we've actually made. Um, moving on to the, the cash flow, and I just want to pick out just a couple of things as we move through this. So our EBITDA is 10.2 million. We've got a positive working capital movement. As I've highlighted, there's a decrease in trade debtors due to the timing of invoices in last year in December 2019. There's a decrease in trade and other payables for 2.8 million, and that's effectively the release of the deferred earnout. And then as you see, we're including in our operation cast the, the litigation investments. And, and this is, a, as it is everyday business, it will fall into the operation cash generated within the business or invested. Um, so we've got cash generated from operations of 6.7 million. We're working on a cash conversion of a roughly around 76%. We've got tax paid of 1.9 million and a small dividend paid during the year of 0.8 million. Um, and that's about it from me. Nikki, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Robert. So moving on to slides that you may have seen before, where we are just um, reiterating some of our metrics. Um, on this slide, I'd just like to draw out um, the fact um, that um, our margins at RBL are approaching 40%. Uh, memory crystals is closer to um, its other peers, and we are targeting 20% for their margin in our first year. Moving on to um, this divisional split you have seen before, and just to confirm that we are focusing on um, expansion into insolvency um, and employment and commercial uh, uh, competition law. I wanted on a summary of where we're at with RBL to um, focus on the fact that um, we have a new managing director in Barry Roach who started last year, and that up until now, um, Rosenblatt had been managed as part of my responsibilities and we really didn't feel that that gave a people business like Rosenblatt the opportunity um, to have its one-to-one -one management. Barry has done an incredible job of bringing together the more people sides of the business that I did not have the time to do, and obviously was appointed with specifically um, the, with the acquisition of Memory Crystal in mind. Um, he has also worked hard on a business development training program in the lower parts of the business, Rosenblatt is very good at delivering its very large transactions, um, and we've been a lot of focus on um, spreading that across uh, more junior members of the partnership and uh, the senior associate team. Moving on to Convex Capital, again, this is just a reminder that this is a specialist sell-side M&A only business. Um, we do not advise buyers um, on their businesses, uh, and in that sense, they're very similar to the rest of the group. They go out and find their deals and make their money. Um, Convex obviously suffered um, hugely last year because the market just wasn't used to um, doing deals um, uh, on screen. Um, and also the many, many private equity funds were sitting on their hands waiting to see when the market would bottom out and where prices would end up. And that had a material impact on their business. But we're delighted to say that they have bounced back in 2021, having, as Robert said, completed seven deals with a revenue of 4.5 million. Um, more interestingly, as you can see in the exchange, the negotiating offers lines on the top right box, they've got six more deals coming in behind that. Uh, they've also materially changed their pipeline so that it is much more evenly spread across these sectors and not um, exposed to any one particular sector, which we did suffer from a little bit at the beginning of last year um, with the travel sector. 
Looking at litigation finance, just a reminder that RBG invests in litigation finance through two different ways. Firstly, through Rosenblatt, where it has some cases that it takes on risk on its own time and puts its own money into uh, that we call damage-based agreements. Through Lionfish, we're able to invest in third-party litigation finance. Lionfish only invests in other law firms and therefore it will not invest in either Rosenblatt or Memory Crystal. Our approach to litigation finance investments has always been staged on this slide, which isn't new. Um, and we have certain metrics around ensuring that we keep the balance between revenue generating cash work um, with our non-revenue generating contingent work, which we will get paid for in fullness of time. In the second paragraph, we talk about a maximum of 50% of external funding to be invested in any one case over half a million. Those metrics sometimes move if we feel um, that we want to keep more of a case on our own balance sheet because we want to be able to retain uh, more of the upside. And that will develop further as the, as the group expands and our balance sheet becomes stronger. I know that Robert has taken you through the IFRS accounting for our financial instruments. And I just want to stress again that we work extremely hard to work with an instrument that, frankly, we, I don't feel is fit for purpose um, for this type of investment and account as close to cash as we possibly can. On the next slide, um, we will see the litigation investments, which are the elephant time ones that we're carrying on our balance sheet within RBL. The numbers are the same as I have presented at earlier Investor Meet Company conferences. They have not changed, but the format of the slide has. Project Neptune on the left hand side had its appeal in March, and we are expecting judgment in H1 2021. That judgment may be privileged or embargoed or may not be handed down entirely. And therefore, we expect the commercial return to fall into H2 2021. Jangra and Mercury remain long term investments, and we don't expect to have visibility on those um, before 2022 at the earliest. Moving on to Lionfish, which we launched in 2020 um, um, in May. I'm particularly proud of the fact that it is a startup business which is profitable in its first eight months of trading. Um, Lionfish is positioned differently to its competitor funders, many of which are running on a traditional model of the share of reward. Um, and if you are lucky enough to get through a, a difficult and long trial to a share of reward, you could earn as much as four times money. We feel quite strongly that this ignores um, the many cases that settle early and effectively prices litigation finance out of the market for many people. As a result, uh, with uh, MyMD Techs, we have developed a pricing structure that means that you're paying a return on money based on time. So if you were to have um, a litigation finance position of half a million, um, you would pay us um, a price based on that uh, being owed to us in year one, year two, year three, year four. Um, and it will be paid on the entire amount of money we made available, even if you didn't utilize at all. Today, we have announced our first um, investment that has come back in. It's a small investment in the hundreds of thousands um, and will be reflected in our current numbers. It is not an exceptional announcement, but it is a proof of concept announcement. And it confirms that we did get a gross two times return on money. Um, and we did not deploy the entire amount that we committed. As you can see, as of the end of 2020 here on this slide, we had 240 inquiries. We committed to seven of those. We have a capital commitment across those seven cases of 4.9 million, including the realization we have today. Um, and we only deployed 1.8 million of that at the year end. So that is very much our structure and that is different to the other litigation funders that you may come across uh, on the market. The outlook, I feel that we had a very resilient 2020 um, and we obviously ended the year with a strong net cash of 3.5 million on our balance sheet. That is not only down to the profitability of the group, but as a result of the um, de-risking of some of our investments in both RBL and Lionfish that take place to a group of high net worth investors, which enables us to de-risk our balance sheet and to fund us such that we can take on more cases. Um, the legal business has had its most successful year in terms of professional services revenue um, than it ever has, um, and its margins have well exceeded 35%. The acquisition of Memory Crystal today is set to drive a new legal services division under a legal services board that will see um, a, a transformation for our group um, in the coming two years. Um, 
I believe that the opportunities with our M&A remain strong. Uh, we do um, continue to look at other um, targets for acquisition, um, and we are still have areas of legal services that we are targeting. However, the opportunity needs to be right. And I was asked today by a member of the legal press why it took us so long uh, to do our next deal since doing Convex in 2019, when many of our listed peers are making acquisitions more regularly than us. And that is because we go after what we want. We only buy what we want and we buy it when it's the right price and the right fit and the right deal for us. And we will continue to apply those criteria going forward. Many thanks and um, for joining us and I'm available for questions um, if you should have any. Um, Nicola, um, Robert, thank you so much uh, for the update. Um, Nicola, as you, as you will be aware, there is an issue with AWS which has prevented some attendees from uh, being able to enter the room today. We had about 87 um, uh, that were able to come in. Some have dialed in. Um, so apologies firstly to those investors. Um, we have recorded this session, Nicola, and what I would propose to do rather than to consume your time any further is when we send a link out to investors, we will give them the opportunity to provide any questions or feedback that they have at that point. And then should there be any uh, responses back the other way, we will then post them in the normal way. Um, so rather than perhaps um, take up more of your time, and I know you do have a very busy schedule on the back of uh, today's announcements, uh, perhaps I could just ask you just for a few closing comments as you would do normally. And then what I'll do is I will then terminate the session and then follow up with investors post this call. Thank you very much. I think I would just close with the questions we've had on other calls this morning, which would be around the integration of, of the acquisition and how we see the timelines for that. Um, we are looking at um, a phase one integration that we think will impact on our 2021 um, numbers, which will be very much focused on the obvious targets of back office stroke, really supplier contracts um, and any other um, integration of the business will impact in 2022. Um, we're very excited about this um, acquisition and are very much looking forward to working with the me memory crystal management team. Thank you. Nicola, Robert, thank you once again very much indeed for uh, updating investors today. Um, I will now close this session and as I have said, I will be in touch and uh, coordinate a response to all the investors that follow you on our platform with a recording of this presentation. So thank you once again for your time. Thanks a lot.